Well, good afternoon. Good. Uh, I'm glad so many of you could be here for the seventh research forum of the academic year in the College of Professional Studies. Uh, my name is Tom Kitts, and I'm a professor of English in CPS. And I've been very proud to introduce a very good friend of mine who's going to take it over and do it. And many of you know Professor Larry Tilly, probably all of you do. Uh, one of the things Larry did over the past year, I think about a year ago, was this book, Duwap Acapella, subtitled A Story of Street Corners, Echoes, and Three-Part Harmonies, which is especially going to be fun today, is when he's not just going to talk about the book, he's going to act it out and sing it out for absolutely some wonderful singers that I've had the pleasure to hear as they're rehearsing right next to my office. <laughs> I've also heard my records before, and they're really good. I'll tell you the truth. Here's what you're in for. I was talking with a student in my office. She thought it was a recording, truthfully. I said, that's live people singing. She said, really? I thought it was a record. So anyway, enough of that. Let me turn it over to Professor Patelli. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't he the best? I mean, that's an intro. That's really dope. It makes it sound like I should sing the whole book, you know? <laughs> we're, not, we're, not, we're not going there. But uh, first and foremost, I, I have to, and I saw her before because we had lunch, uh, right off the bat I have to uh, thank our dean, Dean Passerini, uh, because this, is, this was her idea to have um, not only me here with, with the book, but also just to do this format with, with the singers. And I will introduce the guys uh, momentarily. So I thank her. I thank uh, our learning communities. And we're doing this in conjunction with the Center for Teaching and Learning. So that's Lisa back there. So this is a really, really good uh, joint effort on our part. So I thank everybody uh, for putting this together. So the way that we're going to do this is kind of a little bit different. I'm going to um, do a short reading from the book, uh, just a little bit of, not the whole preface, but just to give you an idea of where this came from uh, and the idea behind the book. And, um, and I do want to thank, literally thank God and thank Roman and Littlefield for the contract because I'm, I feel very, very blessed to, to have gotten that. And I'll explain why because it's a very, very unique kind of a situation. Um, I'll explain also how my involvement with Duop Acapella back in the day kind of forecasted how I came here to St. John's to teach. It's a huge connection. And then after I do that, the guys over here, uh, we're going to sing some songs. I have to introduce them and they'll wave. And I, I have, I'll try to remember all the groups that there. But right over here, this is, this is Tito Santiago. Tito is from the group The, the Eternals, but has also sung with Vito and the Salutations, the Dubs, just rattle off whenever you get there. It's very, very interesting. I have to just give this fact about the Eternals. The Eternals had a huge hit about Lou's wedding day, back in the day. The Eternals were the first all Puerto Rican band, singing group, to have a hit in the United States of America. It, it's in and of itself a great accomplishment. So definitely. Um, right next to him is Kevin Duffy. Whom I just, I got the name right. <laughs> Driscoll. 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 How did I, 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 I memorize that? Okay. Because I know, I know a joke, Driscoll, and I got, okay, Kevin, Dr Kevin Driscoll. Dr Driscoll. Driscoll. Thank you. I just met, I just met Kevin. All right. And, and uh, Kevin was from the group The Horizons, and now he's with New York Expectations. E exceptions. <laughs> Correct me as I go along. This will be edited. And <laughs> thank God for technology, folks. You know. <laughs> and uh, uh, Kevin um, ha ha is one of these journeymen uh, singers who's, who's uh, going to sing uh, an incredible song later on. And then there's John Martelli. And John is from, uh, well, John, there's Randy. And John and Randy, I guess, own the duop band that we play in. And we have our concert on March 9th. This is a commercial effort, folks, as well. We book a product here. I'll even sell the book later at a discount. So, so um, uh, they're, they're part of that. But John has been with legendary groups like uh, Eugene Pitt and the Jive Five. I found out that Tito's been with them as well, with the Passions. Um, Everybody here has been, I think, with been with Vito and the Salutations. Just chime in with all the other groups. So uh, not only am I so happy to be here, but I'm truly honored to be with them. And I, I have to be honest with you, we were 
We, we never sang before as a group, the four of us. I just met Kevin an hour and a half ago. But I've, I've played behind Tito, and I've sung with John. But we, and, and John and Kevin, uh, Tito and Kevin have sung together. John has sung with Tito. It, it's, 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 it's configured that way. Anyway, you get the idea. We'll put it all together. So just so you know who we are. All right. I probably just confused everybody. <laughs> but this is, um, this is a preface to the book. And um, I'm not going to read it. It's just a couple of paragraphs. And it kind of um, tells how this book came about. So it starts off with a set of lyrics. Out on a corner, under a lamppost. 9 p.m. there was music everywhere. A group would gather to sing a cappella. And the harmonies always filled the air. And they would sing. Sha na 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 na. Wasn't it something how all of a sudden they could hit those notes with a sound beyond compare? And wasn't it something how we all would listen? I can still recall those good times that we shared when we heard dum dooby doo dum dum. But whatever happened to that group on the corner and all of that magic? in the air. The corner looks different, and that feeling is missing. But if I close my eyes, I could swear I'm almost there. And I can hear do up, do ah, do ah. These are lyrics to a love song that I, that I wrote uh, many years ago. In fact, it is a love song about the very first time I fell. What makes these lyrics very special is that they're not about some wonderful person whom I met and with whom I had great magical chemistry. Rather, it's about the first time I heard a group singing duab a cappella. <coughs> Thus, when people ask me how I became interested in duab a cappella and if I've ever sung a cappella, this is the story that I retell. And it's a very, very true story to the last detail. It was the summer of 1961, several years before the British invasion. And American rock and roll and doo-wop still rule the airwaves. I was living in Queens, New York. I'm not originally from Brooklyn, sorry. I was living in Queens, New York at that time. And in addition to an almost devotional love to all things Elvis, I was an ardent fan of group harmony, the crest and the drifters being among my favorites. I don't recall the specific night that I fell in love. But it happened on a street in Flushing, New York, outside of Bound Park. I was walking from a friend's house on my way home to Whitestone, which was about 10 blocks away. And right there, I heard it. Umda, 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 le, 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 wa, wa, wa. A group inside the park was harmonizing to the group, the five discs, their song, I Remember. I stood still and I listened. I wanted to go inside the park to see the group, to hear the group closer. But I didn't. There were kids going in and out of the park, many of them appearing to be older than I. But I was 13 years old. I was alone, and, and not my neighborhood. I was afraid that if I entered the park, I might be interrogated with the all too familiar, hey, you looking at us, you want trouble? Afraid that I would be physically attacked, jumped was the descriptive word at the time. So I stayed safely across the street, but in a state of reverie. Those harmonies, the weeping falsetto, the cool sound of the lead singer's voice that sounded like someone I might hear on the radio. And my God, they even had a bass singer. And yes, I fell in love. And even though I was taking classical piano lessons and enjoyed playing that instrument, I wanted to sing like those guys more than anything else. I wanted to be in that group. And what's, what's very, very interesting is, is that several years later, uh, I did become a part of that group. And I'll tell you who the group was. And this was the Channels, OK, a second incarnation. Uh, the Channels were a group uh, from uptown Manhattan who had a big hit, The Closer You Are, and several smaller hits. And they had just recently disbanded. So it was two of the original managers of the channels with these three guys from, from Flushing. And they played the last of the, the rock and roll shows uh, in different places. And then they kind of morphed and group, 
was changed, and I was part of like a fifth incarnation of the channels. I would never ever go around saying I was a channel, but I sung with this this name related. So it's kind of interesting that that kind of happened, and that's how I kind of got interested in um, in duop a cappella, and I sung it and played in different bands. Uh, I'll be very very honest with you with that book. I'm a good writer, but I'm I, there's a gazillion people here, and some of them are here in this room who could write ranks around me. I got that contract because nobody ever wrote um, a book seriously treated duop a cappella. They've treated uh, there's, there's great books on duop music, but nobody ever did duop a cappella. There's there's a book that's out by two guys, uh, Santiago and, and, and Denham, that, that's Santiago, and, and, and it's mainly a discography and pictures, very little text, but this was the first very serious treatment, and I got that because it was just something a little bit out of the box, and nobody, so it was kind of ground, groundbreaking, and so this is why I try to impress on my students to kind of think a little bit differently. That's why we do speeches like, like vintage wine, can I just explain that to you? Okay, you know, Vintage Wine, they had to do a speech the other day. Uh, not W-I-N-E, Vintage W-H-I-N-E. And this is why I do it. So that you could think a little differently and outside the box. Because there's nothing new under the sun, but what you want to do is get a little close to it. Okay, so th that, that was part of that. Uh, how this kind of forecasted my involvement being here at St. John's is very interesting. So let me just share this. And I'm going to give you a little prescription of something that you might want to try on your own, because it's worked for me. Spiritually and religiously, um, I'm Roman Catholic. I, I practice Roman Catholicism very, very ardently, but I also practice something called Anthroposophy, which is the works of Rudolf Steiner. Steiner was this incredible person from the late 1800s to early 1900s. He was an architect, a scientist, an agriculturalist. Biodynamic farming comes from him. He was an educator. Uh, the, Waldorf, uh, the Waldorf system of education comes from him. He was a sculptor. He was a le brilliant lecturer, an artist. He was a seer. He was a clairvoyant. He was a, a theologian, a philosopher. He was incredible. What we all call mindfulness now is the big buzzword he was kind of prescribing back in the 1800s. And one of the things that he says in order to be mindful, and if you ever want to figure out, like, why am I here on this earth? Like, why am I here? One of the many things that you could do is you trace your life backwards. You look at your life. You have to see yourself as, a, as the person in the movie, in your mind's eye. And not by event by event, you, you'll, never, you'll never end the exercise, but just through the years as much as possible. And it's kind of counterintuitive because we kind of think that if we're going to do this, uh, you would want to start, oh, I think I remember my first memory of three and you progress. No, you go backwards. And if you ever want to know what that feeling really is like, try walking in a park uh, when there's nobody around and walking backwards and see what the view is like. It's very, very interesting because you kind of see where you've been while at the same time where you're going. So anyway, if you trace your life backwards, what you'll see is patterns. You do this exercise often enough, you see that you kind of meet the same kinds of people as you go through life and similar kinds of challenges. And then when you fast forward it, you kind of see why you're here and why you make choices. It's a very great exercise to do. And having done this, of course, I traced it back to uh, my, my, my do-op days when I got started, and I did this with my friends in, in the boys' bathroom in high school and, and other street corners. What's very interesting how it forecasted my being here is that when you sing a cappella with a group, and we're going to do this, I guess, in a few minutes, you get to see, first of all, uh, that you have to work with group communication. And for the most part, yeah, I teach Discover New York and Liberal Studies, but mostly I teach public speaking, which is a group communication art. We speak, we listen, we listen to each other. So I learned group communication. I learned to work that our being is a natural instrument because there are no instruments backing us up. That's what a cappella was. So I learned that we're, we're own, our own instrument. 
And this is why, and I'll tell my students here so you get a better sense of where I'm always coming from, this is why the second half of the semester we don't use notes and we don't use the lectern so that you could learn to use your, your, yourself as, as your own instrument. So I kind of learned that uh, back then. The idea to work impromptu and let's try things out as we were doing before and trying out a part and this and, and this and that. Um, I learned that and this is how we kind of like make shift and make things better in, in the speech world. What's very, very interesting how it foretold my, my being here. I mean, I went to school here, but then I started teaching here in the 80s. Um, our university, depending on which poll you look at, is either the third, the second, or the fourth most culturally diverse um, institution of higher learning in, in the United States. And of course, we're here in Queens, New York, which is the most culturally diverse uh, area in the Western Hemisphere, possibly the whole world. Back then, in the, in, in the 60s and in the 50s, um, there, there was um, people almost kind of like self-segregated in many ways, not that people don't do it now, but it was very, very pronounced. But what I did learn was, because when I went here, uh, and those of you who are a little close to my age, and especially if you went to Catholic school, when I went here, everybody was Italian and Irish. That, that was it. In our group, the way the channels were originally African American, and they morphed into these other groups. So by the time I was in, I was with the group, we were, uh, well, I think I mentioned you know, Italian, Sicilian, Spanish. We were uh, a German, Irish. Uh, Puerto Rican and, and Jewish, and I kind of learned that group harmony literally with people who were not of my immediate uh, demographic, and it kind of and I always felt that that was a thread that kind of led me here. So it was very very interesting that the book by itself is almost kind of like a metaphor for my own little journey here. So I, I really really do I, uh, I I I implore you to really try that exercise to kind of trace back your life wherever you are now. And another kind of exercise to do, if you could do this at the end of the day, just for your day, trace, trace your day backwards. But you have to see yourself in your mind's eye uh, in your own movie. It kind of goes like that. So th that's, that's how we did that. So we're, we're going to do a couple of songs in a couple of minutes. And I will explain again how this came about. And then after we do that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get uh, more research oriented and kind of explain the challenges with this book, um, how it came about, uh, and some of the research findings that kind of amazed me. Then we'll do a couple more songs, and then we'll have a question and answer, okay? So once again, thanks for being here. This is really cool. It's a great vibe in the room right now. So um, once again, it's, it's, it's Tito, it's Kevin, and John. Now, John has a guitar over there, so, you know, the a cappella was strictly without instruments, but he has the guitar just to get us in a key, because there's a certain key where the lead singers want it to be. The very last song that we're going to do later on in our little show here is going to be with a guitar accompaniment. It's just going to fit just right, but we're going to do the a cappella. We're going to do um, Diamonds and Pearls, which is a classic by the Paradons, right? And then we're going to do Two Kinds of People in the World by Lil Anthony and the Imperials. And uh, we're going to do it over here. We're going to give it a good shot. We never sang together. Okay, did I ever sing together with you guys before? <laughs> Kevin, did I ever meet you? <laughs> so, um, we only did this literally an hour ago that we, we sang. And this was the nature of what duop a cappella was in the neighborhoods of the boroughs and elsewhere in Baltimore, Newark, Detroit, Chicago, more, more an Eastern <coughs> urban phenomenon. And it was guys from a different neighborhood, uh, or maybe guys within the neighborhood, hey, I know you, you, you do harmonies, let's try it out. And th this is a kind of a, a retelling of that. So you guys want to drink water, and, and we're going to be over here. <coughs> There are diamonds and pearls, emeralds and rings, none of these jewels show me a thing. I want only, 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 I want your love.
me. Whoop, 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 songs uh, 
with, with the research, uh, with, with the book, Do Up Acapella, more, more than being difficult to write, it was just intimidating because there was no other serious work on Do Up Acapella. Uh, there was Do Up Music, but not on Do Up Acapella. And so it was a matter of just kind of, okay, so figuring out where do we go with this and what to do. So the plan was that, um, the plan was just to have a different voice for each segment of this genre. So to treat it uh, historically. So there was the history of it. So, uh, we're, so that, my, my good buddy, uh, he's known as Booksy, but Dr. Dr. Bob Tomes helped me with, with that particular aspect. Uh, then there's sociological uh, chapter, indeed, and that was one of our friends, Joe Tremino, there. There's a business aspect to it. Our associate dean, Glenn, Glenn kind of ha helped me with that one. Um, I'm always indebted to, to, to uh, Tom over here, Dr. Uh, Kitts, because uh, he's the one who's always encouraged me to write, to do conferences. I won't let this go to your head. But, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, I, I said to him, all right, listen, in 30 seconds or less, how do I write a book? And he said, just start writing and start with the easiest chapter. And that for me was just the part of, with speech science, like these notes over here, they're, they're called logotomes when you do the oos and the ahs and the doo-ops, doo-ah. That, that, was, that was easy for me to do, and echo science with physics, that, that I knew. But there's other aspects to it, so there's, there's a, a part. You notice that it, it was the guys on the corner. There were girl doo-op groups. They stayed indoors, and there's, and, and, and there's a whole science behind that. So I have to thank my, my good friend and colleague, Dr. Tuya Parika. Where did she go? Did she leave? Yes. No. All right, well, it's on tape, and you'll tell her that I, <laughs> I, 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 I called her. Uh, and, and she helped me with the women's studies aspect, because this is not my realm at all. And of course, I have to give major props to uh, Dean Randy Ortiz over there for just always putting this together, and for hiring me you know, to play, in the, to play and sing in the band and, and all of that. So I got a lot of help as I, as I got along. So the, um, the approach to it was to uh, have, have a, a different chapter representing different parts. And there, of course, was the fun trivia part. Because do up a cappella, you'll, you'll find it in movies. Everybody here has seen Rocky One, right? Somewhere along the line. That's Sylvester Stallone's brother Frank, who on the street corner is singing those doo wops. There's a quick scene there. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's in a lot of movies, you'd be surprised where you would find do up a cappella. And um, giving credit to one of the greatest. Uh, acapella groups uh, going around of, of do up there were the persuasions so there's a whole chapter so that was that was the challenge of it just to kind of put it together from that point on and that was what was more intimidating than anything else the research itself because my colleagues here have done great great work in, in, you know when we do these and they use these words quantitative and qualitative and uh, it, it's very 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 impressive guys over there <laughs> I can't apply that here because it's not a matter of just gaining statistics and a study and see what happens. It wasn't that. It was giving voice to this beautiful, beautiful genre of music and trying to express it historically, sociologically. There was a business aspect to it, etc. So that's how that kind of came about and uh, was formulated. So um, after doing the research of doing it, Several things amazed me about what I had found. Uh, certain things didn't. I, I mean, like I say, I knew all about the speech science part. I was able to put that together. And I'll tell you also just the way that I kind of did it. Um, a couple of chapters I did in a very, very left brain linear way, you know, from left to right, beginning to end. Other parts, I literally, because I wasn't sure of, of what to do with it, I would get all of my information from books, from journals, online, and I had them all printed out, and then I had big spreadsheets, and I literally, you know the expression, we cut and paste? So I literally just cut out what I needed, and I, and I scotch taped them to the storyboard in areas in, in the sequence. And that's how I was able to just formulate what I wanted to say in a couple of the chapters. And then in other chapters, I just kind of, it just kind of flowed and I knew. In other chapters, it, it was the 
okay, this is the conclusion. I wrote the ending first. At least I knew where I was going with it. So each chapter was kind of formulated differently. My friends here who are in the quantitative and qualitative <laughs> sciences, they're looking at me, right? Who's this madman up here? But guys, this is the way this is the way I rolled over here. And once again, you know, through the grace of God and, and um, Roman and Littlefield, you know, that, that book came out. Um, and but the other surprising things, uh, I, I, I'm very, very, very proud to say that uh, it's, it's an academic work. It's on Amazon and all of that, but it's for academic distribution, for research places. I was thrilled that the book is in Yale and it's in Cornell's and Ivy League libraries, and that, that amazed me right there. So um, uh, it kind of, you know, hey, mom and dad were of your opinions <laughs> <laughs> in one way. You know? So it kind of went there. But what, what amazed me, all right, there's two distinct areas. In the sociological area, um, just the idea of interracial and intercultural groups that formed. And I had to practice this over and over again in my, in my head, and then literally aloud how I would phrase this m most respectfully. This is not ever, ever taking anything away from the civil rights movement, from Dr. King, from the, from the Freedom Riders, and everything like that. But the, uh, who, who fought for, for integration. But in the 50s and in the 60s, during this era, there were groups that, that were um, interracial and, and uh, intercultural. And it wasn't that anybody had to create a law to do this or carry people on a bus to get together to sing. It was just this love of music that kind of integrated people. So for famous groups, there was, we were just talking about this before, Johnny Maestro and the Crest were an integrated group. Uh, the Marcells were uh, an integrated group, uh, the Impalas. Uh, there, there was a couple of a cappella groups, strictly the notable, uh, the uh, Notations and the Chessmen, who got together just out of the love of music. There's a saying that music is a bridge between heaven and earth. It's, 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 um, it's the voice of God that sings. And there's that beautiful, beautiful uh, phrase, I think it comes from a country song, that God respects you when you work, but he loves you when you sing. And I always felt that it was through, it, 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 was, it was the grace of God that got all these groups together, and they just harmonized. It, it, and, and some of them, if they made money, they made money. Most of the times they didn't. But they got together, and this was happening before there was any kind of a political stance being made. That amazed me. It still amazed me. It blows my mind. I had to, um, in between classes, just read that section in my book where that was taking place. It, it still amazes me that that happened. And that's the power of what music does. It just brings people together without any kind of a political stance or anything like that. So that was the first amazement. The other area, and... Um, and, and, well, she could see, it. please tell to you that I'm going to really plug this one over here. <laughs> the two chapters that were the most intimidating were the history chapter, which uh, Dr. Tomes helped me with, and just the mindset behind it. He, sa he said to me, just keep, me just keep moving the narrative forward, which was counterintuitive to me because history is just something retelling. But after I did it, just keep following, just and, and follow the message where you're going with it, tracing the history, because this goes back to Gregorian chants. And in fact, um, the first song that we're going to sing when we come back, uh, Tito's going to sing the lead on that, it's Gloria, and uh, the opening bar is actually, actually, note for note, an old Gregorian chant. I don't know, that's an oldies but goodies, but, uh, but, uh, just the idea of, um, of, the, of the history moving it forward, and then after about a month I got it. I, it, it. It was like a paradox, and I put it all together. But the other area with the women's studies, I'm a guy, I have a lot of testosterone, what do I know from this? I try to be a good guy, I have a daughter, I try to understand, you know? But uh, just the idea of, of the women's studies, it's, it, it's, it's, it's not my realm. So I wrote a, 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 a overview draft, and I went to Dr. Parika, and I showed it to her, and she read it, and she gave me a, a, some hints, and I rewrote it again, and I brought it to her. And uh, it's the idea that the guys were on street corners. They were on 
um, subway platforms. They were in boys' bathrooms. Uh, this, this, was, this was the realm. The girl, you wouldn't find them out in the urban frontier. So I bring my next version to, to you, Dr. Parika, and I show her everything. And I'm doing this whole thing with, with uh, patriarchal societies and, um, and testosterone. The guys are aggressive. This way they go out there. And she looked at it and she says, all right, this is very good. Now you're up to the 1980s. <laughs> a, a couple other things. So I progressed. And the ultimate version is that um, I, 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 I knew what historians were. I never knew there were such people as geographers. I never knew that there were such individuals as feminist geographers. And this was the realm that kind of clicked in why the guys were out on the corner and the, guy, and the girls weren't. And the chapter is called Where the Boys Were and the Girls Weren't. For those of you who know Connie Francis, you know the song Where the Boys Are? Where the Boys Are? Okay, so Where the Girls, Where the Boys Were? All right, you get it? Well, my, words, my speech students get it? Wink, wink. Uh -oh. So, so um, it's, it, what, what amazed me is that there was a, a study published in the Communications Technical uh, Quarterly in 1994 by, I don't know if it was Doreen Massey or... I think it was Doreen Massey. Doreen Massey, right? Okay. Space, place, and gender was somebody else. Okay, Doreen Massey. And she did this experiment. I had, I kind of made reference in the book. She had uh, two groups, uh, men and women. And uh, demographically as equal as possible in terms of education, age, etc., etc. And it was a drawing exercise. And nobody had to be an artist. It was a drawing exercise, and they had to, to draw what they heard via the prompt. The prompts were simple. Okay, draw a space where maybe two people have a nice conversation. All right? Then draw a space where maybe a group of people have conflict. Draw a, space, a, 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 a place where maybe education takes place. Almost invariably, the, um, the women formed... Now, this is an, an artistic endeavor. It's just a a visual rep representation, the women almost invariably uh, drew curved figures, oval, circles, semicircles, moon shape, semi-moon shape. The men almost invariably had right-angled figures, tri um, rectangles, squares, etc. And that kind of kicked in because where the guys were, were always on a, on a street corner, which is 90 degree angle, or someplace there, they were in um, on, on uh, perhaps subway platforms or whatever, which is rectangular, and, and embedded in that structure are squares with the cement lines. Boys' bathroom, up against the wall, linear, parallel lines. One of the groups that I used to sing with, we were um, in Flushing, uh, the Long Island Railroad trestle. It was a long triangle. It was all these these. these places. And, and that kind of clicked in, that somehow in our brains we are wired a little differently than, than each other. So that was a huge amazement right there. And um, just to kind of stretch things out, in, uh, when was it, when we were in Philadelphia? In, in, I think in November? Yeah, yeah with, the, with the Pop Culture Conference, and now we're going to, next month I think we're going to be in Indianapolis. I'm not doing a music panel, I'm presenting that chapter as I did on where the, where the boys were and the girls burned, just to kind of stretch things there. It, it's, it's a very, very interesting journey over there. Music is my safe zone, so this was kind of like stretching things out, but I became fascinated with it. So those two areas, just the intercultural, interracial relationships that music formed way before anything that was politicized, and of course, you know, feminist geography. So that was kind of cool. Um, I see with our time here, we'd like to do two more songs for you. And uh, then we'll do questions and answers, and I think we're, we're good to go. Do you want to explain, um, do you want to explain a Gloria and where that kind of came from? It, it's really good. So Tito is going to sing the lead here, and we're going to do the, the harmony. Uh, it, it's kind of interesting. Uh, this, song. Yeah, the, this next song uh, was done by many groups in the 60s, early 60s, one being the Passions, one uh, the Vito and Salutations. But the original song was the fabulous Cadillacs, 
back in 1954. I was eight years old. I always try to do this song because it's such a beautiful song and it's a, a simple song to do. So you could ask anybody from back, back then in that era, they all did Gloria. So we, we, want, we want to do this for you right now too. Gloria Gloria Boom, boom, boom Ooh. It's not glory
These guys do it with their lives, and they have great stories with the Four Seasons and Frankie Valley and all these these great people. So it's it's really really kind of cool stuff. So if anybody has a question or three of me or the guys or whatever, um, you know, just just ask away. And that that would be cool. Well, look at this. Okay, so Will. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. This is fantastic, and you guys are wonderful. Thank you for coming. Uh, my question is, you kind of mentioned in the preface as you're reading it that you know, that group is gone from the corner. Do you think there's a modern day contemporary equivalent to what the doo-wop a cappella group was back in the day? Is it the beatboxer and the freestyle? Or is there something new that kind of has filled that void in the uh, music of the street, so to speak? I mean, my take on it, and then the guys could really comment on it. If you, if you ride the subways, there, there, there's these uh, doo-wop groups, and, and they're all the guys. <laughs> who just do the harmonies and, and, and they do in the still of the night and all of that. So it is around. Just have to kind of uh, uh, really clarify something. Pentatonics is a phenomenal group, if you, if you know mm -hmm. pentatonics, but they're not a doo a cappella group. I mean, they're, they're phenomenal. So it's a whole other world. So those guys are there. Um, the, the guy, you know, kids who do the break dancing and, and all of that, freestyling, it's, it's, it's like performance art, but it's not doo but we were performance artists, as we kind of did now. I don't know, do you guys feel that way in any way about uh, if there's a doo-wop replica now of the, the guys? Any, do you know of anybody else? Well, that's pretty straight, but they're, 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 they are out there. Do you guys want to come? Why don't you guys stand up and why don't we just face everybody <coughs> here and we'll just chat? You know, yeah. I remember a few years back, I was introduced to a group called Take Six. I don't know if you ever heard mm -hmm. of them. But they were like six guys, and that's what they did, act of power. But I mean, they were, their voices were tremendous. Um, and still, like he says, if, if, you, if you go around, and not that everybody goes around in some ways, but you do find them, um, guys that are still doing stuff from the 50s and 60s. I mean, I, I, sometimes I'm amazed that, you know, I've been doing this for like over 50 years professionally. And uh, I remember like 20, 30 years back, I said, wow, this has got to end soon. You know, here it is, you know, 30, 40 years later, I'm still doing it and still very popular. And sometimes I'm amazed that some of the audience, they're young teenagers. Yeah. And they know the words. They know the words. <laughs> they know the words. <laughs> it's it's amazing. Amazing. I know a kid, uh, he started out doing this maybe 10 years ago. He was 12, 13 years old. Today he's a lawyer, believe it or not. Kid Kyle. Yeah. Yeah. And he's a lawyer today. And he's still doing it. And they still call him Kid Kyle. <laughs> There's, um, if you've watched the, the, a lot of the oldie specials on uh, PBS, Channel 13, PBS, and uh, t the, the main guy that runs that is uh, the promoter, TJ Lubinsky. And he just started, he had a contest that was running on, uh, was on Facebook and of course uh, all the different social medias where they were asking actually for younger people to come out and start to and send a video in of this music because 
he realizes that as, as this is like a pyramid now, and as the as the older artists are unfortunately dying off and retiring and moving away and everything, it's it's becoming more and more. Uh, even the audience is not the same anymore, you know, in a lot of ways. So he uh, he realized in order to keep this music alive, we've got to bring some new blood into it. So he's having this big contest, and he's going to have all the winners on uh, another PBS special coming up in the next probably six months. It'll be on. Randy, you were going to say something that time. Yeah, I want to. May I respond? Directly? Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's a, I, I think that was an incredible question. Where I see that, and I go around, by the way, where I see the response to your question, I see it in prisons. And, and what has happened is, and this street corner stuff, in the form of rap, yeah. is yeah. happening in the prisons. And you, you, you walk into a prison, and I, and I usually do around Christmas time, take a group in there or something like that, and, you know, to, to uh, you know, entertain, you know, just, just to get their minds off of stuff. And, and you see them, almost everybody is into some form of letting it out this way. And, and I hope that responds directly to what you're... Yeah, I, I, was, thinking, I was thinking the same thing. Rap, I, I think, has filled that void. Because a lot, of, a lot of the rap is done in the streets, and it's done without music. A lot of you know, guys hanging out on, on a rap. There's no music. You know, they just, so in, in a way, I think it has filled that void. But, you know, so much music has come out of New York City parks. Mm -hmm. The folk scene in Greenwich Village in the 60s, I suppose. And hip-hop began in the parks when there are no cops to monitor them when they can plug in the street lamps. In the Bronx. Wise. In the Bronx, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Bronx. Not the Bronx. Not always. The, the Bronx. Bronx. The Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I just want two things. I'm going to pass these out to the students to fill out. So please fill them out. First. Now, the other thing I want to say. Thank you. I had a very interesting lunch with Kevin. Oh, yeah. this is a funny story. Yeah, this is a connection. I'll let you tell it about 1964-65. You know, they still do this on radio stations today. You call in with what song you like best. Kevin's band, The Horizon, was up against a couple of songs. Well, we were, we were actually in competition against the, uh, the Beatles, who came out with I Feel Fine that, that, that same week. And uh, we had won, and we were uh, pitted up against them. And there was another group, which was a novelty record, a group called The Detergents. And uh, it drove me nuts because it was a spoof song. It was, it was, a, it was called Leader of the Laundromat. It was, a, it was a spoof on a song by a group called the Shangri-Las that made a song called Leader of the Pack. And so, and I said to myself, this has been put together by a bunch of session studio musicians who got together and said, let's make a joke song up. And, you know, now it turns out, um, of course, we were in a competition at the end of the weekend. Everybody had a call up radio station and vote, and we came in third. The Beatles came in first. The detergents came in second. <laughs> and, you and, all and we up. came in third. <laughs> we came in third. So I'm telling the story, and Tom... Uh, he said something like, I don't know anybody who voted for the detergents. Here I am. Here's the story. Here's the story. I was about 10 years old. I grew up in Staten Island, a working class block, right? And all of a sudden, Mrs. Granito comes running out of the house and tells her, I think we're playing stickball or football or whatever. You guys, go home and vote for Carmen. Carmen, come on, songs on the radio. Go vote for him. The detergent like, what? Yes, you're nice ladies. You like Carmen. Yeah, we'll go vote for him. It was the detergent song. <laughs> Carmine Granito was with the detergents, also did Sugar Sugar by the Archies, went on to work with Barry Manilow. That was not his name on any record. His name was Ron Dante. Now let me tell you, on my block, nobody was named Ron Dante. <laughs> <laughs> they were Carmine Granito, they were Kevin, Kevin Scanlon, you know, Rob Randall. You know, these were the names, no Ron Dante. But he went on to a very successful career. And last part of the story, my wife, who works in TV and filming, was filming him on a special a few years back, about five years ago. Says, go up and say, she texted me, I said, go tell him, Carmine Granito, how you doing, Carmine? See what happens. So she did, he was always a nice guy. He started laughing. He says, how do you know that? She said, well, my husband's name is Tom Kitts. The kid across the street. <laughs> 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 anyway, anyone else need these? Probably lost by one vote. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.
coincidence. Is that crazy? That is crazy. Anybody else have a question? Oh, okay. Um, I see you play the guitar, and it's meant to have 12 strings. Is there a reason why you have six strings? Yeah, because I play classical guitar, and, 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 the, and the, the neck is wider, like a classical guitar. You can take the other strings. That's the only reason. <laughs> I was going to say, pl playing under the L and on the street corners must have created a number of one song or single song wonders. Uh, people who created single songs. Can you comment on, on, uh, one on that? Wonders. I'm a no hit wonder. <laughs> I, I always, we, we hear that terminology a lot. We, we all sing it in different groups and we travel around a lot and we perform a lot. And, and when somebody says to me, oh, those guys, they're a one-hit wonder, I always say, how many did you have? <laughs> <laughs> Think about it. Think about all the, all the groups that have been around. They're just in the Brill Building, how many groups recorded? Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it might have been one hit, but those groups are still working today because yep. of that one hit. Yep. Like I said, I'm in 50, 50 years in the business. You know, the Eternals only had, there had three recordings. One of them reached number 11, just miss, missed the top 10. And then the, the second recording was number 14. But back then, uh, there was always problems because every group back then, they all got robbed. Nobody made the money that they were supposed to make. So uh, in our case, our lawyer, we started suing people. So this record that reached number 14, which I think would have gone even further, was actually pulled off the shelf because of the lawsuits and stuff like that. But still today, because of these uh, one hits, we're working. And I, we, I, I, got, I could say that, hey, I've been to California, Las Vegas, Florida. I, got to, I could say that I sang at Madison Square Garden, Radio City Music Hall, you know, places that when I was growing up, I said, wow, I, one day I would like to sing there, you know. And I did. So one hit, okay, that's fine. They're still working. <laughs> right. and, the hit, and the hit was Babalu's Wedding Day. Uh -huh. Babalu, if, you, if you want to know. So check it out, Babalu's Wedding Day, The Eternals. Uh, Larry, so what, about, what about one hit wonder with a group like Stan and Del Sax? Exactly. A one hit wonder, but what else did he do? Stan's group, Stan's group, this is Stan Ziska, right. who's cited in the book, it gives credit there. Stan Ziska is uh, the lead singer of a group called the Del Satins, who had an original hit, right? I guess yeah. we could say, Teardrops Follow Me. But the Del Satins were the backup group for Dion. Dion was originally Dion and the Belmonts, then Dion went, went solo, had all those songs, a Teenager in Love, a Run Around Sue, and all those. And Stan and his group, the Del Satins, were, were his backup. Uh, you hear the Del Satins, that's the backup group vocal group. Without credit. They didn't get the credit for it. Without they didn't credit. get the credit for it. No. In fact, um, the way he told the story is that uh, they got, those, those songs sold millions. And Dion did become a millionaire. Yeah, I think he had very good representation. They got, I think, $24. 28 $28 <laughs> for being in the recording studio this session. For Run Around Sue. If you know Run Around Sue, that song still plays and bringing in an income. Here, fellas, here, here's, 20, here's $28. I don't even think they got lunch, you know, and, and that's just the way it went. But you hear the Del Satins on all those songs, classic harmony. Some of the Del Satins went up with Johnny Maestro with um, uh, the Brooklyn Bridge. So they, they kind of, you know, made a living and got out there. But can you imagine if there was equity in the law and how much? they could have gotten just being a part of that because those harmonies are part of those records. You know. Thanks for bringing that up uh, with, you know, with Stan and Cisco. Yeah. Anybody else have a question on three? Or? Say oh, okay, it. Bo, uh, Bo and, then, and then Bob. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for being here for this trip down memory lane. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. What came to mind, you talk about one-hit wonders. I remember, you know, back in the day, Murray Decay and all the, uh, the music was played on the radio all the time, constantly. And there was an, a an issue with something called payola, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and maybe you gentlemen could comment about if your record wasn't played, and sometimes records were played incessantly, 
and it became almost like, I gotta get that record. Could you maybe uh, comment on that, uh, about uh, your knowledge of it and the impact it had on making a hit record? Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, some groups didn't make it because of that. They weren't willing to pay, you know, uh, um, not Murray the King, but who's the other big guy? Chris Farrell? Alan Freed. Alan Freed. Alan Freed. Alan Freed. He was the biggest one. And I mean, if you didn't pay, your, your song was not getting, uh... now, the Eternals were lucky because we were involved with Bruce. That's Bruce. 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 Yeah, he was one of our co-manager, promoter. His father loved the Eternals. So our records did get, you know, played yeah, on that, until the lawsuit. That know? went on. That went on quite a bit, I think. I, think. I mean, I, mean I, I really don't know for a fact, but I mean, we, we could have actually wound up in that contest that I talked about because of, of, of that, you know, and then maybe they just didn't pay enough for us to, to take it over the top, you know, I mean, that, that's, that's very possible. Bob's a good Bob. Uh, yeah, it's a kind of a follow-up to uh, uh, Professor uh, Broderick's. It's about the, uh, the theft and the vulnerabilities that these groups had when it came to, you know, creating their music. Uh, what, was that uh, uh, pretty much running rampant at that time? Yeah, it was. very, very rampant. You know, you know, most of these groups back then, they were teenagers. Yeah. You know, so they didn't know anybody. You know, uh, I remember with the Eternals, <laughs> when they, we went to sign a contract, they would say, you know, just bring your mother, you know, <laughs> your father at home. You know? <laughs> and, I mean, I, I got to say, the original songwriter of the Eternals, he's still around, he's, he's, he lives in California. He still gets money, he still gets royalties and stuff like that, because he was a songwriter. And then the manager, which he didn't do, he, had, his, he did not write anything, but he put his name on it. So he was still getting royalties, and he wasn't entitled to that. And he still has a, his estate, still gets royalties. Uh, maybe about 10 years ago, we, we, we produced our own uh, CD, and it was actually stopped. We had to stop it because of the estate of our old manager, his daughter. He said, no, 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 you can't do that. So we had to stop it. Some of them. Talking to the guys throughout the years, uh, and working with uh, many of the groups, and it's the same story over and over again. They have a million, a million seller. They run to the mailbox for their first residual check, and it's minus one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Recording expenses, promotion. So they never ever got paid. And if you wrote a song, in most cases, when you sat and signed the contract, the record company would say, "Well, you didn't write this song. You know, we did. You want the contract or not?" Now all the money was made in the songwriting and the publishing. So the artists never ever made it. Some some did, but most of them did. Bob, you had a question. I think it's been answered. Yeah. And do we have uh, one more? We, we could do one more question. And we could all hold hands and sing group harmony together. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys, for coming down. Thank you so much. Many professors write, write books, but all of them get, get a chance to perform. <laughs> and thank you, Professor Pavili, for yeah, this wonderful performance that you gave us. And thank you, John, you know, for being with us. Uh, just a reminder, first of all, I want to thank um, the Center for Teaching and Learning for being a partner in this, uh, in this uh, evening event today. And uh, we're also going to collaborate again on March 1st. And on that day, Professor Pavili, Make a note of this. Our next meeting of CPS Faculty Research with CTL is qualitative and quantitative research. <laughs> so, so please uh, join us on that. Okay. Oh, and, 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 and just once again, um, on on Friday at 7:30, it's in Randy. It's in the DAC on the on the fourth floor. We have the salute to the veterans. 
and it's it's a concert with, with the orchestra. So the it, it, John and John and and Tito and myself and a cast of thousands will be there, and, and Amelia. Amelia's over there. Amelia's oh, yeah. our good friend, musician, and really great singer as well. Uh, we'll be there, and uh, the money that we collect goes to the veteran the veteran center right. here for our, our veterans. Is that that's going to be on, on Friday, March 9th. you got to buy your tickets in yeah, advance. And, yes, and I do want to plug once again, that concert is the one that we did last year. That's through the good graces and energies of our Dean, Dean Passerini, mm -hmm. because uh, without, without her, all, all this is impossible. Yeah. It's, not, it's not possible at all. So, you know, God bless her for all, all her good positive energy. So anyway, hope to see you on the night, and we'll sing up a storm. We'll be rehearsed, really, really rehearsed. <laughs> <laughs> cool.